Good morning, Arbor. If you just had an anniversary, I hope it was better than that. Welcome to Arbor. If it's your first time here, my name is Scott Hetherington. I'm one of the regular speakers here. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy your time here and that you'll come back and join us again. If you're a regular attendee, thanks for coming up on the day that I'm speaking and not staying home. I appreciate that. Um, I'm getting excited. I see far more Seahawk jerseys this service than I did last service. And uh, it's a late start game, so that's good. I don't have to be in a hurry, but I'll be done by two to get, make sure we're all home for the game. So hopefully this time we won't have any regrets. We'll get through the game today. It's a big call. But we're continuing our series called I Choose. Last week, Jake talked about choosing purpose over popularity. The theme that we're using in this series is life is not determined by chances, but by choices. Life is not determined by chances, but by choices. Today, in that I Choose series, we're going to be looking at choosing discipline over regret. The idea is that by choosing to live a disciplined life, we can diminish our living in regret. I'm sure we can all look back in our life and think of choices we've made that we've regretted. Like the time I drank 12 dozen raw eggs because I thought I was channeling Rocky Balboa. And it didn't help that my friends were, you know, around chanting, chug, chug, chug. Or the time that I thought I could swing from one vine to another vine across a rocky ravine like Tarzan. Just saying that doesn't really work well. Or maybe we should have handed the ball off at the one yard line years ago. Dude, sorry. Why, why do I got to bring that up on today of all days? But the beast is back, and if it comes down that again, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes. We're going to do a jump pass. All right. While many of these and other poor choices, all right, led to some physical and painful regrets, all right, in one form or another. Most of them were due to my own ignorance and hubris of youth, but I've also encountered and enduring other regrets from other failures or lack of judgments in my adult life. We're not alone in our struggle of trying to choose discipline all right, over regret, and I hope that today that we can look through Scripture and find out what Christ has to teach to us about the power of discipline over, the, over, or over regret. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our time here today, Lord. I thank you that we can come before you each and every day, study your scripture, and learn anew what it is you have to teach us. Lord, would you give us ears that want to hear, hearts that want to listen, feet and hands that want to put into action what you teach us today. May your message be heard today. In Jesus' name, amen. Life really is about pain. Isn't that a fun way to start a Sunday morning together? Life really is about pain. It's either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You're going to have both of them in your life. Pain is a relative term, though, and interpreted differently by each and every one of us and by various means. One person's pain may be another person's motivation, and there's varying levels of pain. I'm reminded of one of my favorite stand-up comedians, Brian Regan who does a little bit about going to the emergency room in pain, and the nurse comes in and asks him, along with a bunch of other silly questions, what is the level of pain that you're experiencing? And Brian begins to agonize about, well, I don't want to say a four, because maybe that's not serious enough for them to take me serious, but I think if I say an eight or a nine, I've heard that breaking your femur is the most painful thing somebody could say. So if I said an eight, I don't want the guy with the broken femur coming in here hitting me over the head with his crutch saying, you don't know what an eight is about. He goes, and I can't say a 10, like labor, because my wife, according to Carol Burnett, has said, you know, men can't experience that type of pain unless you take your bottom lip, pull it out, and put it over the top of your head. So we're stuck with this dilemma of the level of pain. And so when we talk about pain today, everybody has a different interpretation of just how much pain you can endure. And I have seen some people endure some stupid pain. And I have seen people overreact from what I would think is little pain. But the idea of pain is this. You're going to encounter it in your life, either on a path of discipline, the pain of being disciplined, or the pain of regrets from not being disciplined. 
We all understand the concept that to achieve a goal or to reach a plan, we need to have a purpose, an initiative to follow the plan. To do what we have set out to do, and it will inevitably involve some pain. Let's say that you want to get out of debt. You may have to encounter the pain of not eating out. Maybe no movies, no vacation, no new shoes. The new car has to hold off for a while. Maybe you want to lose some weight this time of year, January. That's a big thing people want to do. And you may have to, you know, go through the pain of no pastries, the pain of exercise, the pain of eating green things, or for Jake, the pain of not drinking Pepsi. Maybe you're wanting to improve your relationship, have a good marriage, and you may have to understand the pain of what it means to be truly accountable pain of truly being vulnerable, of honesty and trust. If we don't choose the pain of discipline, we will encounter the pain of regret. And I would dare say even choosing discipline along the way, you may encounter some pain of regrets along the way. So my wondering to you today is, what are you going to choose? And my challenge to you today is this. I would like you to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. Choose discipline over regret. Both involve pain. But one results in far more freedom than the other. We're going to look at a passage today, but before we dig into it, I need to give you some context. It's a passage out of Romans written by the Apostle Paul. But if you don't know a lot about Paul, you don't understand the depth of this passage. Some of you may not know the story of Paul, but in brief, Paul was a fanatical Pharisee, a religious zealot of his day, commissioned by the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, to go out and do one thing, wipe out the Jesus movement, the way, these little Christ or Christians as they called themselves, to eliminate this message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul took this seriously, and he traveled the region from city to city, seeking out Christians and persecuting them and killing them. Men, women, children. There's a story early in Acts of Paul standing there holding the cloaks of men that stoned the martyr Stephen. He was the leader, the zealot, that was responsible for the death of thousands upon thousands of Christians. And then one day as Paul was traveling to Damascus, He had an encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ, and he fell off his horse, and he fell on the ground, and as he's blinded in his eyes, and he's hearing the Lord, his creator, say, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? He repented, he came to restoring salvation with Christ, and he became the apostle Paul, before that known as Saul. And Paul went from being the religious, fanatical zealot of a Pharisee to the driven, disciplined, purposeful Apostle Paul that became a church planter, the greatest missionary we had known, starting churches all over the region. He penned more letters in the New Testament than any other apostle. He stands at the epitome and the peak of what many people would call the the penultimate example of what it is to be a follower of Christ. So many people went from fearing Paul to admiring him for the Christian leader that he was. And so we find in Romans, this letter he's writing to the church in Rome, a very interesting passage about living this disciplined life. And here's what Paul, this anointed apostle, says in Romans 7, verses 15 through 24. And I'm reading out of the NLT today, the New Living Translation. I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do, for what I want to do, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that I, what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong, it is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I want to do, I'm not only doing, I'm I'm not really the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. 
I have discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Can you relate to this passage by Paul? Oh, man, I've been there. Why do I keep making the same stupid mistake? Why do I keep doing that? Woe is me. Oh, my goodness, I can't get this figured out, can I? For me, there's some comfort when I can find comfort in other people's misery. Isn't that sick? I don't like to think I'm the only one miserable. I think that's why I said, oh, this tastes terrible. Taste that. Why would I want to taste that when you just told me this tastes terrible? Because I can't get the taste out of my mouth, and I want you to have it stuck in your mouth, too. Ah, it's a nasty taste. So when I can look at Paul saying, I struggle with the same thing, and that Paul is talking about trying to achieve a life lived in holiness and fullness with Christ, yet even he struggles to do that on a daily basis, I get a little bit of relief when I hear him saying, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Folks, there is a real struggle to live a disciplined life. So here's a secret that I think we can pull out of this passage today. Discipline is choosing what we want most over what we want now. Discipline is choosing what we want most over what we want now. You could paraphrase that is delaying temporary gratification for long-term gratification. But we don't do that very well. At least I don't do it very well. So it begs to ask, what is it you want most? Take a moment and ponder that question. At this point in time, what is it you want most? Maybe it is a Seahawks victory today, but I hope you can go a little deeper than that. Maybe you do want to lose 20 pounds. Maybe you want to get out of debt. Maybe you want to find a husband or wife or a meaningful relationship. Maybe you want to win the lottery. Maybe you want a new car. Maybe you want to find your calling in life or purpose. Whatever it is that you want most, we all have things we want to achieve, and they all require discipline. Paul states that he is not even able of choosing discipline consistently, choosing what is best and right. So if the Apostle Paul seems to struggle with this, then how are we supposed to do it? Well, the answer lies in the next verse that we didn't read. The last verse in this passage, verse 25 of Romans 7, Paul says this. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So if, I, so if I'm being asked, and I'm asking you today to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret, you need to know that there's going to be a struggle. This passage is telling me that simply choosing will not be enough. That it's a true struggle, a true battle between flesh and will. It's the age-old battle they used to depict in cartoons with the devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other shoulder. I don't need a devil and angel. I got enough messed up stuff in my own head to tell me what I should and shouldn't do. But we're all there. We all know that internal battle, that internal struggle. So if you're going to choose discipline, don't think that you're not going to be without failure along the way. Don't think that discipline means perfection. It means that you're choosing a disciplined life for a purpose. And if you choose Christ to be with you in that discipline, you will have far more success, far more joy, far more relief than if you choose to do it without him. Paul gives us another great analogy. Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, uses a metaphor of an athlete. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, again out of the New Living Translation, we find this metaphor. Paul writes, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. 
I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. See, the Greeks had two great athletic festivals, the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games were held at Corinth, were very familiar to the Corinthians where Paul was writing this letter. Contestants in the games had to prove themselves for 10 months of rigorous training to qualify for the games. The race, the marathon, was the penultimate race of these games. And this is the event that Paul is trying to use to illustrate this Christian life when he says, those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize. Not like today where you participate, you get a ribbon, you get a trophy. Everybody wins. I, I'm not opposed to that. If that's how you roll, that's fine. I never got one when I was a kid, and I'm a little bit jealous. Maybe that's a regret. I, only first, second, and third place got them, and I didn't get those very often. We won't talk about that. <laughs> no one would train this hard for an event not to try to win. Yet out of the large number of runners, only one wins. In one part, it says this, Paul counsels all believers to run in such a way that you may win by setting aside anything that may hinder you. In one interpretation, other interpretation, it says this, throw off anything that hinders you. Whatever it is in this discipline you're choosing, whatever hinders you, you need to get rid of it. These athletes throw off everything that hinders you, took that so literally that they would throw off everything and they would run naked. Now, there's a good reason to be in first place for an entire race if I've ever had one. <laughs> Would not want to be running behind contestants, but I'd want to be as far out in front as possible. I don't think that we're drawing the conclusion here today that to be disciplined, you need to get naked. That's not what we're saying. We're not that kind of church. <laughs> that assumes there is one out there like that. I don't know where that is, but maybe in South France. I don't know. Somewhere, all right, the athletes took this on to mean, I don't want any, anything that will inhibit me moving forward in my discipline. Because they didn't want the regret of, oh, if I'd only done that, I might have won. How many might ofs do we have in our life? Oh, if I'd done this, I might have. If I've done that, I might have. Because that's what regrets are. They're a trick of the mind that you might have been in a better spot than you were if you just should have done that. See, discipline is about freedom. Discipline is freedom, and it hinders regret. Discipline is the freedom from getting into regret. Discipline brings freedom of knowing you're doing what you should do. I believe the reason that I struggle and that maybe we struggle so often with discipline, doing the things I know I should do and doing the things I shouldn't do is that I have the wrong perspective of what it means to win or what it is I'm trying to win. We are not trying to win a prize, but we have a purpose. My second point is this. Discipline must have a purpose. Discipline must have a purpose. If you are trying to get out of debt, is your reason just to get out of debt? I would hope there's a higher purpose attached to why you're getting out of debt. If your discipline is, I want to lose weight, I want to get healthy, that there's a purpose for why you want to do that. It's not just losing weight. If you're trying to restore a relationship, what's the purpose and reason that you're doing that? Now, we can come up with all good reasons and purposes on our own outside of Christ. But I'm telling you, when you couple it inside of Christ, like Paul says, but with Christ, all things are possible. Your purpose takes on a whole different meaning, a whole different context. See, in the Olympic and Isthmian Games, the athletes exercised great discipline to win a temporary prize. They won this wreath. That's right, they didn't run for a gold medal, it was a wreath. That got placed on their head to signify they were the champion. And over time, that wreath would fade. Now, with the championship came the temporary glory and the hero worship and the immortalization of them in legend as a champion. And while we may remember our champions of past, all right, they're not the same today as they were yesterday. They don't carry the same cachet. For every Michael Jordan, eventually comes along a LeBron James. 
And after a LeBron James comes along somebody else. For whoever your heroes were, somebody else newer comes along because it's all temporary. So the idea is that if what you're running for, if what you're disciplining for only has a temporary purpose, you're not going to stay motivated. What's the eternal purpose of what you're trying to do? It should all connect back to freedom. And there's only one person I know that can give you true freedom, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. The relationship and the intimate knowledge of him making you be your best self. Because really all we set out to be is to be our best self. And we can't be our best self outside of Christ. See, we don't strive for a perishable prize. We're striving for something imperishable. We're striving for something eternal. So whether whatever your goal is, whatever it is you're disciplining yourself in, whether it's in learning, an artistic endeavor, a business venture, your marriage, spiritual living, witnessing, finding a goal to push for, whatever it is, it's accomplished through this discipline and self-control in walking with the Spirit of God. See, Paul had a clear purpose in his running. He didn't have just an aimless running. He made it clear in previous verses that Paul's goal was to win as many people to Jesus Christ as possible by as many means as possible. That does not need to be your purpose. It should be a product of your purpose, but that was Paul's calling. Paul trained rigorously because he feared that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. Paul did not want to lead an undisciplined life and lose any credibility to encourage others to leave a disciplined life. I've never gone to a doctor that didn't complete medical school. I've not met with a financial advisor that didn't know anything about money or was thousands of dollars in debt themselves currently. They may have been at one point and gotten out of it. The point is this. We as Christians often disqualify ourselves in living and looking and seeing a disciplined life because we're truly not willing to do the pain of what the discipline calls for. See, many believers start the Christian life with enthusiasm and devotion. They train carefully for a while, but then the troubles of life, the temptations of life, the burdens of life come up like weeds and choke them out. And for one reason or another, they fade away, and the vigor and the life of what they're trying to do kind of seeps away from them, and they're left with regrets. Reminds me of when I go hiking. I love to hike, and one of my favorite things is to get to the summit of mountains. And most times in hiking, if you've done any sort of hiking, you're in an encounter what they call switchbacks. You can get up a mountain by going straight up it. It's usually not the easiest route. I don't encourage it. I have some regrets from trying to do those things. Sometimes it requires more equipment, some banged up shins, really tiring, some avalanches, not good things. But if you work on the switchbacks, the switchbacks are intended to get you to your destination through a series of less steep paths. However, anytime you see switchbacks, you might see these trails that go between the switchbacks. People shortcut. Oh, I'm not going to use this switchback. I'm just going to cut right here. I'll walk part of the switchback, and then I'll cut right here. And they don't think anything about it because the first person to do the switchback doesn't leave much of a mark. The next few people see it. They don't leave much of a mark. But over time, a path is created down the mountain that leads to erosion. And when the rains come and the storms come, it creates a stream of water that wipes out any path that gets you to your goal. It ruins the trail that people have come along and laid out before you for you to lead a disciplined path to get to the peak of what it is you're achieving for. Because in a moment, you thought you'd save an extra two minutes to cut it off. How many times do we do that in our life when we're trying to choose discipline and we take a shortcut here or there and it ends up not being a shortcut. It begins to erode away the very thing we're trying to be disciplined about. See, our prize cannot be something temporary. Our prize cannot be just getting to the top of the mountain. Our prize has to be seeking freedom, our best self in Christ. Because if that's not what the purpose is about, if that's not what we're trying to be disciplined about, then we're no different than an athlete trying to get a wreath on our head. So whatever it is that we want most, debt-free, addiction-free, healing, restoration, trust, a healthy body, a great marriage, it should never be for the purpose of 
Christ, it should always be for the purpose of Christ being honored in what we're doing, not us. Perhaps, though, you're here today and you're saying, Scott, I've tried discipline. I keep messing up. Maybe you find yourself weighed down by past mistakes, failures, or broken promises. Maybe it seems all is lost. Because you did not practice the self-control or discipline you were so determined this time around to do. Well, I've been there as well. And I'm not talking about just chugging a dozen egg yolks and then going on a five-mile run, which ends in nothing but scrambled eggs. <laughs> sorry, it was sitting right there. I had to go there. I'm sorry. You know, can't take a guy out of junior high. Junior high is always in me is where it is. I'm telling you, I've been there. I stand here having walked through many regrets because I didn't maintain the discipline that I thought that I had. I have found myself ruining the present because of something I did in the past. Rather than just regrets, I like to call them vain regrets, though. Because it is vain to think that I can change the past. Or that wallowing in the mistakes of my past will rectify the present state of affairs. Instead, vain regrets paralyze me from taking the action in the present I need to keep moving forward. The Apostle Paul, who also referred to this problem in his letter to the Church of Philippi, talks about this very thing. In Philippians 3, 12 through 14, we find Paul saying this. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Let me read that again. Forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Does that resonate with you? Are you in a place where you're stuck in regret and you need to find a way to continue to press forward? Let me tell you something, people. Discipline is not a perfect path. We are imperfect people. You may have perfect intentions, but you are not perfect. I don't know anybody that got from point A to point B without some struggle, battle, hurt, mistakes, meandering along the way. Discipline is a journey to reach a goal that along the way you may find God changes your goal. To step off of the path and not come back to it, that's going to be regret. I have gone on many hikes and along the way, as I'm going up the trail, all right, or I'm coming down the trail, mostly when I'm coming down the trail, I love to encourage people. Oh, you're almost there. You've got about 20 minutes left. You're going to make it. Nice job. Keep going. I can't tell you how many people I've passed. Literally, they're 10 minutes from the top. 10 minutes from the top, and they're done. They're packing it up, and they're turning to go back down the trail. I go, oh, you've only got like 10 minutes. In fact, sometimes I've said, I'll turn around and walk up with you. I don't want them to miss the view that they're 10 minutes away from. They don't know the depth of regret that they're going to miss when they get to They're just 10 minutes from it. I press on to take hold of that, forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead. Be like, well, this is Paul. Well, Paul had plenty to regret. I just told you everything he'd done in his previous life. You can't find anybody in Scripture that didn't have a regret. From Adam to Abraham to Jacob to David to Samuel to Joseph to anybody to Peter. Goodness gracious, you don't think Peter had some regrets? That guy had Nike breath. He put his foot in his mouth so much. He was constantly saying and doing things that he had to go backwards and figure out and recorrect and get back on the right path of discipline. We are no different and they are no different. See, Jesus says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All sin means is to miss the mark. 
The word sin means it's an archery term. You aimed for that and you missed. Folks, my life is full of more misses than makes. Michael Jordan is infamous for commercially put out in the 90s saying, I have missed more shots than I have made. I have failed more times than I succeed, but I got to the top because I continued to press forward. Discipline is not about perfection. It's about a relationship with Christ that you can journey on towards a goal with purpose that we are working for more of an eternal prize than a temporary prize. If God is willing to forgive us and forget, we are foolish if we do not do the same for ourselves. To continue to relive the forgiven sins of our past is a waste of time. It is a trick of the enemy to prevent us from living fully in the present and living a full, meaningful, purposeful life with Christ. To live in the past is undisciplined. It denies and doubts the discipline of our Savior, who, taking on the very form of man, did not consider God something to be grasped, but gave himself up to be crucified on the cross. Do you have anything that could be harder for you to put behind and forgive than someone sitting next to you? Someone in the scripture? We're all in the same game. Let's decide to say today to live with no regrets. Refuse to be the one that says, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I should have taken better care of myself. If only I could have forgiven him or her and restored a relationship. I should have made better money decisions. I never planned to end up here. I'd give anything for another chance. I wish I'd never started whatever it is that led to addiction. I had no idea how it would ruin my life. I have broken too many promises to be trusted again. I can never go back. Jesus is standing here saying it's not too late. Refuse to be short-sighted. Refuse to be plagued by regrets. You've never gone too far that God can't redeem you, restore you, forgive you, and give you a second chance. I have said it ad nauseum up here. If you come here regular enough, you know that I have been divorced. You know that I went through a lot of pain for many years. I could have sat in the regret of the mistakes I made that led to a divorce. I could have sat in the pain and the regrets of not having to be there for my kids all the time. But no, I chose a disciplined life to be there and be present, and God has restored things I didn't think possible with me and my kids. You need to get up out of your regret, and you need to start running again. Running today to win an eternal prize. As Paul said, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not shadow boxing, which is pretend fighting. I discipline my body like an athlete, train it to do what it should do. You were called to be a champion. With Christ, you can be a champion. Run to win. Run with a purpose in every step. Keep the faith. Keep it real. For some of you, it's time to get back in the game. Start running again with the right purpose for the right purpose. Discipline is not perfection. It is choosing to get back up, refocus your purpose, and choose discipline over regret. Choose the pain of discipline, which results in freedom, over the pain and regret, which results in paralyzation. I don't want a bunch of paralyzed Christians in my presence. That's not what we're called for. We are called to the freedom of Christ. So I ask you today, let's choose discipline over regret. Let's pray. Thanks for joining us online here at Arbor. If you enjoyed watching, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on whatever social media platform you use. Maybe you're interested in joining a group, volunteering, or just want to get to know us more. Visit our website, arborchurch.com. I hope you have a great day and thanks for watching.